Would you turn with me to Ephesians 4? Pick it up at verse 17. <clears throat> Ephesians four seventeen. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Would you bow with me? Father, we come to you this morning because we believe that your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to get down into the nooks and crannies of our souls. We thank you that the word is the written testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, though it's his word that we hear today. And we ask that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to obey, that we might follow our King. We commit this time to you now. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to be back again. See you all this morning. I trust that this time together in the Word will be encouraging to you, will bless you, and will strengthen you in your faith. If you're outside of Christ, will provoke you to consider Christ for yourself. I'm wondering if you've noticed how important aromas have become to us, has, have become to us these days. I mean, think about it. There are all sorts of air fresheners for our cars, for our homes, for our public restrooms. And there's a plethora of deodorants and perfumes for our bodies. I'm an Old Spice and Irish Spring man myself. The bar, not the body wash, the bar, old guy. In fact, I once dropped a pretty penny on perfume for my wife in Paris. We like perfumes, don't we? By the way, speaking of Old Spice, I recently saw a March Madness commercial for Old Spice uh, touting its benefits for the feet. We're even putting Old Spice on our feet now. There's also a multitude of toothpastes, Mouthwashes, chewing gums, and mints for our breath. A little secret from our dentist, if you don't like to floss, flossing can help with halitosis. Just saying. And there are even some special aromatic sprays for our pets and the furniture they foul, like Febreze. I remember how handy that was when our family was breeding Labrador Retrievers. That Febreze was a real friend. Yes, you and I are desperate for pleasing physical aromas. But there's another class of aromas of far greater importance, spiritual aromas. Did you know that each of us gives off a spiritual aroma for better or for worse? Every one of us does. True, it doesn't affect the olfactory receptors like physical aromas, but spiritual aromas give off a spiritual scent nonetheless, which is detectable to others and most of all, to the God of heaven. And the most important question is this, how do you smell to God? Is it a pleasing aroma that our King takes in? when He smells you? Or is it more like my daughter's dog after rubbing herself in a dead skunk? Yeah. That one will stick with you, won't it? To say it another way, are your brothers and sisters in the church eager 
to be in your presence? Do they look forward to that? Or are they prone to subtly avoid you because of the offensive spiritual odor that you give off? Now, we introduced this fragrance motif, the idea of a well-pleasing sacrifice, in January when I was here last. But it seems appropriate to do some review from the series we started last September. I don't know if you know this, but we've actually been in something of a series since last September. You say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's on me, isn't it? Uh, It's like, they just seem like a bunch of one-off sermons to me. But there's actually a method to the madness. And back in September, we began by examining our status in Christ with the goal of helping us to embrace who exactly we are in Christ. Remember, Jesus said that if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. The good news, if you know Jesus Christ, is that you've been set free from sin's slavery, from death's tyranny, and from the flesh. As Romans 8 says, you are no longer in the flesh, but in the Spirit. You have shifted spheres. You have changed realms. You're under new ownership. And thus, you're not the wretched man in Romans 7. Remember that sermon that many of you didn't like? You're not that wretched man in Romans 7, despite how you feel about how your day's going. That's not Romans 7. That guy has no victory. You see, the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That's the answer to the wretched man in Romans 7. You see, when God diffused that quickening ray and you first beheld Jesus Christ by faith, you received a new spirit who made you a member of the new covenant community by effecting a new birth, whereby you received a new heart inscribed with God's law that enabled you to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. See, you and I have become new creations. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We became spirit people. We became free from sin's controlling power people. We became free indeed in Jesus Christ. That's who we are. It's who we have already become by faith in the one who died for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Embracing who we are in Christ as free indeed allows us then to exercise that new covenant freedom in worship to God. In January, we said that the essence of that worship is presentation, an offering of ourselves as a sacrifice to God, which conjures up the Old Testament sacrifices, doesn't it? Every morning and evening, the priests offered up a spotless lamb on the bronze altar, the brazen altar that was just inside the temple courtyard. And they offered up on the altar of incense, fragrant incense that altar just in front of the veil that separates the two uh, uh, places inside the temple itself. The sacrifice is to be a living, holy, and well-pleasing sacrifice. Living as empowered to lose one's life for his kingdom. You have to be alive in order to die. Holy as fully consecrated to his service and well-pleasing as continually emitting the fragrant aroma of Christ-likeness. That's worship, and we're free to engage in it. A sacrifice, a perpetual, ongoing, well-pleasing sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, God has saved you in order for you to worship Him by filling His nostrils with the aroma of these sweet-smelling sacrifices of praise, of prayer, of ministry. We'll talk about those in May when I come back. But no doubt, the top aroma is the fragrance of love for one another. Jesus said it was the new commandment to love one another. 
Paul said in Romans and Galatians and James in James chapter 2 that love for one another fulfills the law. It fulfills the law. Paul again says in 1 Corinthians 13 that without love we become nothing but a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. We're just noisemakers. So this morning, we want to sniff around your love life. This morning, we want to look at your love for one another in the church. Discover how aromatic, how pleasing it is to your Heavenly Father and help you to excel still more in loving one another. We want to start by looking at the passage that I read at the top of the sermon. And I want to go through it just quickly. We don't need to get bogged down because we really want to go to the next passage. So Paul forbids these Gentiles to walk as Gentiles in that day walked. And he summarizes their walk, the Gentile walk of that day, in two phrases. First, he says the Gentiles walk in the futility of their darkened minds. There in verse 17. And as a result of their darkened, hardened, ignorant, calloused hearts and minds, he says they gave themselves over to sensuality, practicing all manner of impurity and greed. There in verse 19. Well, Paul is quick to point out, starting in verse 20, that these Gentile believers did not learn Christ that way. Now, the idea of learning Christ really means take on Christ or or put on Christ or have true faith in Christ. And Paul is telling them that when they believed in Christ, they were joined to Him in His death, burial, and resurrection, and they became new creations. That's what they learned. They're new creations. At that time... Then they learned a whole new way, and it was branded, that new way was branded on their hearts by the Holy Spirit. The law was inscribed. Specifically, what they learned, they were taught and thus empowered to put off the old man. Sin's dominion, they learned, was broken, enabling them to lay aside their former manner of life, which is that old man being corrupted according to deceitful lusts, verse 22. And instead, they learned that by virtue of their formerly darkened minds now being renewed by Christ, they learned that they were to put on the new man, the one being created according to God's righteous and holy image. If we were to connect the dots with Romans 6, we could say it this way. To put off the old man is to no longer present one's members as instruments of unrighteousness. To put off the old man is to mortify the deeds of the flesh. They were taught that. They were made to understand that that's who they are, people that do that. And to put on the new man is to present ourselves as those alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness. To put on the new man is to present ourselves to God as his slaves, to present ourselves as a sacrifice, living, holy, well-pleasing. See, Paul is enjoining these believers to exercise their freedom to worship God. And primarily, as we'll see, as a well-pleasing sacrifice and fragrant aroma of love. Since all the commandments are summed up in the command to love one's neighbor as oneself. That summarizes all the commands that God has commanded us to do. They're summarized in the commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another as Christ loved you. That's the summation. Now, with that quick review, we want to look at love's profile. We want to better familiarize ourselves with its smell, with its scent. And to do that, I'd ask you to turn back to Ephesians chapter 5 this time. And to go to the middle of the passage, and then we'll go to the beginning and work through it. Verse 5, verse 1, chapter 5. Paul says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering 
and sacrifice to God. Of course, Jesus is the true and ultimate fragrance of love, isn't He? His life was the paradigm of true love as He gave Himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's what He said. He said, Greater love has no man than this than to lay down His life for His friends. Yes, we know love by this, First John tells us, that He laid down His life for us. There's the measure of love right there, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But what are the particular aromas for the sacrifice of love? Paul placed this passage, 5, 1, and 2, in the middle of a literary unit that goes from 425, I believe, to 5, 6. And that unit fills in the love picture for us. And so let's just read that whole passage, starting in verse 25, and I'll go all the way to verse 6 of chapter 5. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave Himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So let's flesh out this profile of love that we might make a better sacrifice to our God. First, he says, having laid aside falsehood, and by the way, we did that when we joined Christ in His death by faith. So having laid aside falsehood, love speaks truth to its Christian neighbor. You notice how neighbor is now churchified. It's not the community of Israel. It's now a fellow member of the New Covenant community. Love speaks truth to its Christian neighbor. You see, before coming to Christ, and this is a hard truth, but it's a truth nonetheless, before coming to Christ, you and I were liars. That's who we were. We were liars. If not by commission, meaning actually telling lies, then by omission, leaving out what needed to be said in order to be truthful. Most of us prefer the omission side of lying. It's less vulnerable. But here's what happened. We put off the old man at conversion, and now we're filled with the spirit of truth. Are we not? The starting place for love in this list that Paul gives is honesty. It's hard to be honest with one another, isn't it? You know, honesty leads to intimacy in relationships. And what I mean by that is it leads to authenticity. We're not wearing masks. We're being real with one another including showing off our warts 
and blemishes and everything else that we'd rather others not see. You see, that authentic relationship, which is contrasted with what one speaker called billiard ball relationships. You know, you come in Sunday morning and you have billiard ball fellowship. You just bounce off of each other. There's no indentation. It's very superficial. This is what honesty produces. Now, in all fairness, it is risky, isn't it? But it's what Christ demands, and it's what He's equipped us to do as new creations. Yes, love smells like honesty. Of course, I'd be remiss to not say honesty doesn't always mean full disclosure. There has to be a place for discretion. But we mustn't be discreet to the point of being dishonest. Second, when love gets angry, it doesn't sin because it doesn't stay angry or give the devil an opportunity to exploit that anger. Now, anger is not always sin. Did you know that? Are you clear that anger is not always sin, sadness is not always sin. The various emotions that God has equipped us to feel, they're not sin when they stay within their boundaries. Anger is not always sin, but it quickly turns to sin. It goes toxic very quickly when it's left on the burner overnight. You know, this past summer, we had terrible flooding in the state of Vermont. In fact, you may have seen it on the news. At one point, the entire capital, now Vermont's a small state, but the capital, Montpelier, was completely underwater, meaning there wasn't a building that at least there wasn't water in the first floor. I heard of one harrowing story where a dear woman went to bed Uh, Her husband had one of those CPAP machines, so he couldn't really hear anything. And uh, she started hearing something that sounded like a waterfall. They lived a pretty long distance from a river, but it was bordering their property. She got out of bed, and immediately she was in two feet of water. And she quickly woke her husband up, and by the time they got out of their house, it was chest deep. They went out in the middle of the night, really a desperate move. Both of them had a dog over their neck. And wouldn't you know, by God's grace, a boat came right down where it was a road, but now it's a river, right down the river and saved them and their their dogs. We had terrible flooding. You know, I love rivers. Rivers are beautiful things to me as long as they stay within their banks, right? But if they overflow their banks, they're dangerous. That's how, that's how anger is. Love, love does not stay angry. Here's the good news. You and I are free to put off that old man of persistent anger while the sun's still shining. We don't have to go to bed angry. I may have told you this before, but Sue and I, we've been married next month, 43 years. We made a commitment when we got married that we would not go to bed angry. And that's a commitment that we've almost perfectly kept. There's a few times she's messed up. Uh, (laughs) At Christ Memorial Church, the joke light would go on at that point. No, I've been the bigger problem, but maybe just a handful of times in 43 years. That's like once every five years. Because anger becomes toxic when it's allowed to overflow its banks. And the devil will take that anger and he'll exploit it for division and schism in the church. So when love gets angry, it doesn't stay angry. Love smells like self-control, an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it smells like. 
Third, love stops stealing. Maybe we could say love stops hoarding. And instead, it works hard. Love has an impressive work ethic in order that it may share with those in need among us. Now, how basic to love is that? Sharing. Sacrificing what's ours and giving it to others in the church. We read about that in Acts 2, don't we? We read about that in Acts 4. They were holding everything in common. They were selling their land so that the proceeds could be distributed to those in need. Kind of a what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine mentality. I've told you before, I have 17 grandkids, many five and under. And I can tell you, sharing doesn't come naturally to those kids. Oh, my goodness. Before Christ, we really didn't like to share. We were selfish. Like my grandkids, our motto was, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine. Sort of the the jungle law of the nursery, if you will. But the new man wants to share. The new man actually believes, he actually believes that it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's the change that Christ has wrought in us. We really believe that stuff. Love, therefore, smells like sharing, doesn't it? It smells like sharing. Fourth, love restrains destructive, Holy Spirit grieving words, and instead it speaks words of edification. As they say, the proof of the pudding is in the taste, and the proof of being a new creature, free in Christ, is the ability to control this demon in my mouth, which is connected to my heart. I've got a new heart, and now I am able to control my tongue. You are able to do that. The old man used to spew forth words that tore down, but the new man with the new heart inscribed with God's law speaks, albeit imperfectly, words that build up, not tear down. Love smells like edifying speech. Fifth, love puts aside hatred. It puts it away from the person, from you. Bitterness, anger, wrath, clamor, slander, malice. It puts those aside and instead walks in kindness and forgiveness. I mean, aren't those ugly words and attitudes, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice? Those are ugly words and hateful attitudes. But here's the thing. You and I, by virtue of our union with Christ, by faith, are free. We're free to put those nasty things away from us. That's who you are. You have that freedom. And instead, we're free to put on love, which includes kindness and forgiveness for one another, and the forgiveness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. You and I are free to remember the sins of others against us no more. Boy, that's tough, but we're free to do that. And by the way, if you're sitting there and saying, well, well what do I do when I sin? You, you've, already, you've already put me under the ground with this sermon. I feel guilty. Obviously, none of us do that perfectly. Well, here's the good news. You and I are free to repent, Right? We're free to say to our spouses, I am sorry that I got angry at you. I'm sorry that I was curt. I'm sorry that I copped an attitude and was pouty. Would you forgive me? Oh, God, would you forgive me? And we know that our Lord Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. So don't think we're talking about any perfection. No. But we are trying to get a hold of our basic freedom so that we can flesh out this profile of love in our everyday lives. 
Love smells like forgiveness, doesn't it? And finally, love rejects all sexual impropriety and filthy, crude speech and instead walks in purity and thankfulness. 3 to 6 in chapter 5. You know, we've become a nation of potty mouths, haven't we? I mean, the F word has replaced the word hell in our profanity index. And sexual improprieties and innuendos are par for the course. You can't, you can't even watch a G-rated movie where at least there's not some innuendo. But again, dear one, the Son has set you free, which means we're free to stop being perverted in word and deed. We don't have to play along. We're free to stop being crude and coarse and instead to be paradigms of thanksgiving. Don't you like being around those kind of people? People that are thankful rather than people that are just crude and crass, which is what we used to be before Christ got a hold of us. In fact, did you notice verses 5 and 6? Paul says, Those not putting off these things and smelling like hate instead of love are destined for wrath. You see, smelling like hate is unacceptable. True conversion always smells like purity and thankfulness. True conversion smells like love. So, what are we saying this morning? What does love smell like? Not falsehood, but honesty. Not ongoing anger, but self-control. Not stealing or hoarding, but sharing. Not destructive words, but edifying words. Not hatred, but kindness and forgiveness. Not sexual impropriety or perverted speech, but purity and thanksgiving. This is what love smells like. We might call it aromatherapy for the soul. Now, I'm sure that I really haven't said anything new to you today. Ephesians 4 and 5 sound a lot like 1 Corinthians 13. The love chapter sounds a lot like Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Sounds like Colossians 3. Ephesians and Colossians are very similar. But allow me to encourage you in closing with two thoughts. The first is this. You are free as a kingdom of priests. That's what we are. You are free to offer up a sacrifice of love every single day, just like the priests of old. This is not too much for you. You see, if you're in Christ, by virtue of your union with Him in faith, you have fundamentally put off the old man, and in its place you have fundamentally put on the new man. So each day you're just bouncing off of that. You're just springing off of that foundation that has already taken place. You're just acting that out, carrying out that reality that has actually taken place because of faith in Christ. You became a new creation, and now you have the power within you to continually offer up this sweet-smelling sacrifice of love even to your enemies. Now you say, Wes, why are you emphasizing that? Because if you don't have the confidence that that's possible, what are the chances that you're going to do that? I mean, can you imagine Michael Jordan? I like Larry Bird better, but can you imagine Michael Jordan taking the last shot or saying to the coach, I'm not sure I want the last shot. Maybe you should give it to Horace. Can you even imagine that? Or can you imagine Jordan taking it and thinking he's probably going to miss it? But what the heck? You know, they pay me all this money. I probably ought to take the shot. No. His ability to make the shot is linked to his confidence that he can make the shot. I'm not an opera fan, but I do love listening to Pavarotti. Do you think he hopes he'll hit that a high C? 
Uh, I don't know if I can get it. Well, we'll give it a shot. No. See, our confidence is basic to our performance. If you don't believe that you're free to offer up a sacrifice of love, I think you're going to be timid. You're going to be tentative. You're not going to attack sin boldly. And so I want to get in your minds that you have the power. It's called the Spirit of God. He has circumcised your heart. He has circumcised sin. He has inscribed the law. That means we're enabled to do it on your heart so that you can offer up continually a sweet-smelling sacrifice of love. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Make a vow. I know vows can be debated. I'm not really talking technically. But resolve. Call it a New Year's resolution. Resolve to love Christ's church. Just decide, I'm going to love Christ's church. I'm going to love every single person in Faith Community Church, even the ones I don't like. Now, the good news there is there's some that don't like you either. You know, you want them to make the same commitment, don't you? To love you. Like, who, who couldn't love you? My goodness. You're so lovable. But we're committing. We're making a resolution that by God's grace and through the power that works within me, I am going to love my brothers and sisters at this church. I challenge you to resolve to do that based on what God has done for you already. And when you mess up, when you act hatefully toward one another, just employ your newfound freedom to confess it quickly and get back into the game. Yeah, okay, big surprise, I messed up. Let's get back into the game. Now, by the way, for those outside of Christ, I'm wondering if you're aware of the odor given off by your self-centered life. My guess is that you're not. My guess is that you probably think you smell pretty sweet. But there's nothing that smells worse than selfishness, than self-centeredness. And that's what you are outside of Christ. Self-absorbed, self-centered, a life of selfishness. You can't change that. You need a miracle of grace to change your heart. So let me give you the good news. If you'll confess the stench of your sins and turn to Christ, who died in the place of sinners just like you, He will wash you clean. You will begin to smell sweet so that you will now begin emitting a fragrance of love. Let me encourage you. Come to Christ now before it's too late. Come to Christ before you die in your sins and are forced to smell the putrid odor of sin for all eternity in a place called hell. Jesus is a willing Savior. Listen to me, unbeliever. He's willing to save you this very day. So I call on you to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You will be free to love as He loves. Don't wait. Don't wait. The second thing is this. I find this very encouraging. When you understand love like this, as a sweet-smelling fragrance to God, no act of love is irrelevant. No matter how small, no matter how obscure. Think about it. Every time you serve your brothers and sisters in Christ, God is pleased with that aroma, with the sweet-smelling sacrifice of your love. Every act of love toward one another is an act of worship toward God. I don't know, that, that encourages me. Uh, I may have shared this illustration before, but some of you know that Sue and I spent the last eight years of her mother's life taking care of her. 
She was a severe Alzheimer's patient. She came to live with us. She didn't know who we were. She was barely speaking, and we had the privilege of taking care of her. She was a sister in Christ for eight years. You know, the last five years she was on a liquid diet. The last three years she was completely bedridden. You know, feeding, washing, some of those things for me, my wife's a nurse, for me were a little more difficult. But it was an act of worship because I was serving my sister in Christ with all of these behind-the-scenes things that we had to do in that situation. That encourages me. There's nothing that you're doing in service to others that's not a well-pleasing sacrifice, a fragrant aroma to our God. And hence, all of life, all of life becomes a sanctuary, doesn't it? Becomes a cathedral for worship as we offer up our sacrifices of love for one another. So I say to you, Faith Community Church, let us worship our great King every hour of every day, loving one another just as Christ has loved us. And let us keep the fires on the altar burning brightly so that we may continually present well-pleasing sacrifices of love to the very lover of our souls. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank You for this time. Thank You for Your Son. Thank You for His love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank You for the Spirit that lives within us. We thank You that the power of sin has been broken, that sin can't bully us anymore. And when it tells us to hate, that we're free to say no and instead respond in, in love, being honest, not continuing to be angry, sharing with one another, speaking words that edify one another, forgiving one another, being paradigms of purity and thankfulness. Thank you, Father, for that freedom. We want to give ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to loving one another. In Jesus' name, amen.